I don't care if it, if it records my um, But anyway, hello everyone. Um, I'm Mark. So today we're just going to be going over a, a general introduction to ANSYS simulations, like how they work, a little bit of, of what's behind them, um, so that hopefully a bit of the, the learning curve and the shocky feeling that you get when you first open these applications is is reduced a little. Um, and we're going to walk through a few examples if you want to stick around for those. Um, I imagine this first theoretical part will probably be pretty short. Um, so first of all, just to introduce like what is ANSYS, what makes it special. Um, so the company is like this giant multinational corporation, obviously. And what, what it's done is it's progressively swallowed up a bunch of other simulation companies. So now it has this like ridiculously wide range of systems to offer. Uh, and what makes it really special is that its software has linkages between these physics systems that are based out of its workbench interface, which you can see in the little picture here. Um, and what it allows you to do is transfer solutions between different solvers. Um, so, for instance, if I simulate something in Fluent to you know, determine aerodynamic loads on a structure, I can then drag that solution over into the setup of a static structural problem, and then I can directly input the aerodynamic loads that I calculated in Fluent onto my structural system. So that allows you to model a lot of physical phenomena. Um, Sol or ANSYS also has its own CAD software known as SpaceClaim. Um, to prepare models for use. Um, I'll, I'll show a little bit of that. It's, it's a bit special compared to what we're, what we're used to dealing with. Um, one thing that ANSYS does really well is detailed composites modeling, where you build a composite ply by ply, um, which is very useful for us and something that I'll, I'll demonstrate today if you guys want to see it. Um, another thing that's really cool is parameter variation. So you can set up a, a load or a dimension or a, another boundary condition as a parameter. And then instead of having to redo the simulation each time, you can input that parameter as a table and then just leave your computer for an hour or so while it chews on that. And then um, out will come the, the, sol the solutions that you want for all those different parameters. Um, so the major ANSYS systems that you'll be working with um, I would imagine our workbench, uh, that's the starting point for your project uh, in most cases. Mechanical houses most of the systems that ANSYS didn't buy from someone else. So that's the basis for your structural, thermal, vibrational, and electronic, mo most of the electronic programs. Um, and it's also where you'll do all of your meshing. Um, so you'll get to know mechanical very well, hopefully. Uh, Fluent is the primary CFD tool, or computational fluid dynamics, um, that, that we'll be using. It has several others that are designed for, for other things, or CFX, which is its older version. Um, but Fluent is, is the more modern one, um, so we'll be, we'll be tending towards that. Um, and then Space Claim, as I mentioned, is the CAD tool, the successor to Design Modeler, which is really crude, but it's still installed on your computer. Um, and when you right click on a geometry cell, it will ask you if you want to open it in space claim or design modeler. And please choose space claim because that's hard enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Diego. What is a meshing program? Oh, we'll, we'll get into that in a second, actually. That's okay. one of the things that I want to go over. Um, so a note about ANSYS files that's, that's really good to know, especially when you're sending stuff around. A normal ANSYS file um, is called a project file, and it has that weird file extension that you see there. And it is always paired with a folder that has the same name, um, except with the underscore files at the end, and is contained in the same directory as the WBPJ file. Um, and that's the standard arrangement. That's what ANSYS likes to use when you save it. Um, you can store a bunch of other user files in there from your results um, based on you know, custom options that you save. But it means that you can't really email your project to people directly like that because you can't send them the, the folder. Because inside that folder is a bunch of other little files. Um, and unless, unless they're together, it won't load. So in order to send projects to other people, you have to upload it as an archive file 
which is .wbpz. Um, and you have the option to contain result files in this condensed version. Um, so in your, normal, in your normal project here, you'll go on File Archive, um, and I'll demonstrate that. And obviously, if you don't contain the result files, your file size will be smaller. But whoever gets it on the other side will just have to use their computer to regenerate the results. They'll just have to, to run the program again. But it's already set up for them. Um, so they'll get the same numbers. Let's see. So what I want to do before we get into the demonstrations is to talk about how the simulation works, um, like meshing and, and that sort of stuff. Because unless you have like a basic understanding of where they're going with it, it'll be hard to understand the purpose behind the controls that you'll need to do to get a simulation with the, the fidelity that you want to have. Um, and th this is the general theme behind simulations, is the balance between what you call computational cost and model fidelity. Um, and computational cost is basically how long it takes, how hard it is for the computer to do. And then model fidelity, obviously, is, is how well it represents what you're actually trying to model. Um, so this is a, a really good example of the idea of simulations, which are the, the Navier-Stokes equations um, for, for flow. Because there's no way to really solve these directly. Um, and even if there were, it's a nasty partial differential equation. So your computer would end up using numerical methods to do it anyway. Um, since it, it's very difficult to have a computer you know, solve exact solutions, which you can't do for these anyway. Um, or when you have a really complex geometry like this, it's hard to set up the, the boundary conditions that your equations will be seeing because they have to match this geometry. And like, you know, Calc 3, it's write an equation for this hyperbolic paraboloid, and now write an equation for this. And so. Boundary conditions are one thing I wanted to right. bring up. Um, right. So we have boundary conditions for like nozzle. Up to the end of the <laughs> I know it's like a weird place to come with it, just surprise me, but this is the reason I figured it would be a conversation I have in front of everybody that might yeah. know what we're talking about. And for posterity on camera, this is good. Oh, this is on camera. This is me barging. It's so on brand. Um, so, yeah, so I guess anyway, for you guys, like, know one of the answers problems that we're dealing with right now for space two is how do we qualify the heat transfer from the combustion gases into uh, the nozzle and make sure that we don't yield the aluminum. Uh, which has a melting temperature uh, that is way too low. <laughs> um, and so one of the things that uh, we're having trouble with, because not just setting up the antisense, but defining boundary conditions, um, has been a bit of a pain in the ass. And so, mind if I just break it down for you what I've got? Sure. I th sorry if this is like totally derailing things. Uh, um, well, you know what, this might be a good conversation to get into after I go over You want to do this afterwards? Yeah, well, I'll just go over, like, because I'm doing a general overview of, like, how the simulations work, and then we can talk about that and, like, maybe apply some of that. So, yeah, perfect. Is that cool? Yeah, sounds like fun. All right. So, ANSYS works on the principle of finite element analysis, which is that you can't solve exactly for this whole thing, so you break the model into these small pieces, and we call these pieces elements. Um, and then to this model that you've now broken down, um, you apply boundary conditions, which come in two types, essential boundary conditions, which you apply, and the natural boundary conditions, which the solver is iterating towards achieving. It never exactly hits those. Um, that's where you have your, your convergence, and once it gets close enough, then your, your simulation ends. Um, and part of determining your fidelity is how, how good close enough it is. Um, you can solve linear or second order equations for each piece, depending on, again, the, the cost versus fidelity issue. And then those values are interpolated across each element to apply to the next ones. Um, so you create elements using the process of meshing. This is really important because it's the basis of any FEA simulation. There is the, the refinement trade-off that I mentioned. If you have a coarse mesh, like this one here, it has a low computational cost, it'll be done really quickly, but you also tend to have lower fidelity. Um, a fine mesh, on the other hand, is, is the opposite in both. And so it, what you need to do when you're running a simulation is finding the best balance between those. What you'll often want to do is run mesh refinement studies, 
So you make your initial mesh maybe not as good, and then you identify key areas where I really care about this part of the model. I'm going to refine the mesh here a little bit and see what that does. And if your result changes on a level that might be interesting, then you'll say, okay, then mesh refinement matters here, and I need to refine it more in further iterations until I get to the point where the solution isn't changing enough for it to really matter to me. Um, the shape of the elements is also important. Uh, here you can see their, their prisms. Um, another very common shape is tetrahedrons, so little triangular pyramids. And depending on your model and your problem, there are different shapes that are best. And you also need to make sure that these shapes aren't too distorted, because the more distorted the shape is, the less accurate your interpolation across that element will be. And there are ways and answers to check the quality of your mesh to make sure it, it's going well. Um, so convergence, I mentioned a little bit. That residual is, is how much is left over as, as you're continuing to solve. Um, you can see here this, this plot is the demonstrates the newton raphson method, which is what the computers like to use, especially when you're doing higher order solving. But the principle is the same. Um, so eventually, it'll keep driving the solution closer and closer to this zero point here, where it intersects the x axis. Um, but it'll never exactly reach it. Um, there's always a little bit of a residual. And you tell the solver how big you want that residual to be to determine the accuracy of the solution that you want. Um, there are, as I mentioned, different solution methods. Um, and then, then load steps is another good thing to know. Um, because in order to achieve convergence, you have to be within a, a certain, for, for a lot of problems, you have to be within a certain radius of the actual solution. Otherwise, it'll diverge. So what ANSYS likes to do to help out with that is build up the load gradually. So it'll apply the load incrementally, and then it'll gradually improve the initial guess for the full load to improve convergence. Um, so here's an example of what divergence looks like in Fluent, in particular. Um, see how the little, little bar here just goes up in spikes? That's the residual, the little extra piece. Um, it's, it's not in balance anymore, and instead of the solver driving it down towards convergence, it just keeps building up and exploding and getting worse and worse and worse. And so that's what divergence looks like um, in case you ever see a plot in ANSYS of your solution that's doing that. Um, so then model selection is the other really important thing. Um, what equations do you use to model the system? Because there are many ways to do it mathematically. Um, just take fluid dynamics as an example. You have Bernoulli. You have the Navier-Stokes equations. Um, for the Navier-Stokes equations alone, you have like six different solution methods to choose from an instance. You can use ideal gas properties. And you need to determine which is best based on the conditions for your simulation. Um, boundary conditions, which Max was mentioning, are also very important because you need to figure out how parts of the simulation interact. Friction, for instance, between two parts. Friction requires second order solving. So it can be very difficult to model. And friction is one of those things that is very likely to cause divergence, um, especially if you have a harsh friction condition. So one of the things you want to determine is, can it be neglected? You know, can I model this as bonded or frictionless, depending on how it moves? Um, and then the other thing is, what information do you actually have about your environment um, that you can model? Um, and then, if you don't have all the information, do you really have enough boundary conditions to, to constrain the model? Um, so we are now going to go into some examples, but I think with that note on boundary conditions, it might be a good chance for, for Max to work. Oh, yeah. yeah I'll to the, let me show you what I got here. So one of the things with, uh, sorry, me, with isentropic flow is that your conditions are changing throughout your model. Um, and it can be a little bit difficult. There's some basic assumptions that your like heat transfer into your wall is highest at the throat, uh, and there's some other assumptions that are made about the state of um, uh, of uh, your 
your turbulent flow basically it's a, it's sort of a couple boundary layer conditions that have to do with like to the power of what um, am I experiencing the like heat transfer effects a distance away from the edge so there's a lot of good math that's been done on this I did not do the math to determine like what my heat transfer coefficient is along this nozzle um, that is actually using an equation called Bart's equation um, and so I've been working with this to figure out basically um, what we have what we know about our nozzle is we know, or we know about our rocket, is we know like a lot of the fundamental constants of our gas, we know things like our specific heat ratio, uh, we know our density in the tank, we know our upstream uh, temperature, upstream pressure, all of those things can help us write formula for figuring out when we're here at the throat down what our temperature is here, what our, what our temperature is, what our density is, what our pressure is, what our upstream velocity is, um, and what our viscosity is. These are all the like functions that you need. And so using Bart's equation, which I was, um, if you were looking at the ANSYS chat, I was talking with Mark about this today, you're able to determine um, your like HG, this is your heat transfer coefficient for convection. Um, and when you're doing heat transfer, it's all about this number Q, that's like the end, a number of joules I'm putting in per second. Um, and that is related to my like difference in temperature, and then this thing called the uh, heat transfer coefficient Hg, which is different for like any the Hg here is like the coefficient of heat transfer for that gas. Um, so all solids have like a conductive heat transfer. All gases and liquids have some convective heat transfer, and then there's like radiative heat transfer, which is just like heat being lost to. Um, ambient air, heat being lost, to, or not heat being lost to ambient air, but heat being lost to like environments that are just at different temperatures in a uh, vacuum. Um, and so basically what we were able to do was to figure out what our like heat transfer coefficient and our temperature are right down here along the length of the nozzle all the way down here and determine what our heat flux is as a function of our position along this length. Um, and so that's like an example of, all right, well, if I want to do a thermal sim on the nozzle, it's not just as easy as how hot is it on the inside and is that going to convect? It's like, how does it convect? Um, like, how am I addressing this heat transfer? And then how am I going to actually uh, implement it into the model here um, in a way that like makes sense physically? You can't just say like, oh, there's hot gases on the inside. You can't assume that it's all the same there. Uh, and like what's interesting is there's actually like one part of this that can be pretty difficult to determine uh, for like a rocket nozzle that we're still trying to work through now to like give you guys an idea of the limitation of boundary conditions is that while Bart's equation is great for after the nozzle when the flow becomes so-called choked, uh, that's isentropic flow. If you Google the isentropic flow equations on Wikipedia, uh, NASA also has some good formularies. It's pretty fundamental stuff for designing rockets. Some people might have seen it before, some of you might have not. Um, but it's good to understand that you know these relationships. Um, but we have n really no idea, we have like stagnation temperature back here, but we really have no idea of how the heat transfer works uh, along the converging section of this plate into the throat. Uh, and so that's like the next problem that we're trying to solve in terms of boundary conditions to get a full idea of how this nozzle will perform. Does that make sense? So like when you say like boundary conditions, like how is it that you define them? Like you just put like a geometry. Well, so think, think about it like this. So a boundary condition is anything that helps me define exactly the uh, problem I'm looking at using the fundamental equations that I know for that specific type of problem. So if I have like, okay, if I'm trying to do like analysis on a beam and bending, all right, and I know the material of the beam and I know the shape, my like moment of inertia and my density or my like modulus of elasticity uh, are going to be the same no matter what for a given material. Um, but my boundary conditions are, all right, well, I'm applying this load on here. How am I like holding it on this end? Those are two things that change what the actual response of the beam is. So that's an, an example of a boundary condition. For heat, for like thermal stuff, another example of a boundary condition would be, um, I am walking down the street and I feel air blowing on my face and I need to know the specific gas constant, which is like, I don't want to call it like, you know, your modules of elasticity for air, but it's one of those things that's like a fundamental property of that state of matter that I'm trying to analyze. Um, and then what's like my velocity, how fast is the air coming at me? Um, and then what temperature am I at and what temperature is the air at? And that would help me determine what that heat transfer is. And if I were to try and do analysis on like my body, 
and say, what's the heat transfer into my body? Well, I could use all about, I know about like me moving through the air and the air to figure out what the heat flux is into the body. And then my body has conductive heat properties, right? Um, because that conduct convection is from like a liquid to a solid. Um, a conduction is like inside of a solid. Uh, I would be able to use the convection from air, what I know, those are my boundary conditions to do the conduction into my body model. That's if, if does that make sense, Diego? So basically you have like a bunch of like set conditions you have to apply. It's, yeah, it's like what makes your problem special? What makes it unique? Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. I think that's all I've got for you now. Okay. Yeah, that's all I really want to talk about. But I have some of these numbers that I'll send you that I don't want to run through. Awesome. Uh, yeah. In the way we set this up last time. Okay, so um, we're going to start and see how the, the meshing and boundary conditions work together. And a little simple example. Um, so this is Workbench. Um, I'm going to make a new project. And let's do a, a steady state thermal across a rectangle. So if I, if I set up space claim, um, and these will take a little bit to load, so you're welcome to, to ask questions in between. <laughs> What's a steady state thermal? So steady state thermal um, assumes that every point in your model is at equilibrium. So nothing is changing over time, um, which makes it a lot easier and, and quicker to solve. You can also do a transient thermal simulation, um, like Max is talking about for the nozzle, where you're only simulating the load being applied over a, a given amount of time. Um, okay, so this is this is what space claim looks like. Um, it looks kind of like other CAD softwares, but it performs very differently. Um, dimensioning is weird, so I recommend using construction lines out of the origin um, to start building up. Um, to start building up your geometry um, so that when you're building a construction line and then we just want a flat rectangular sheet let's call it 50 millimeters and now I'm going to demonstrate one of the stranger features of ANSYS which is the, the pull tool it works kind of like extrude except it combines revolve and sweep um, into one um, it, it can be a little tricky and confusing at first coming from other software, but so let's say I want to pull this line into a surface. So I'll click on the line, I'll click on my axis, and then I'll just pull it in the direction that I want it to go, and it'll make my surface. So there we go, 20 millimeters, and now I have my rectangle that we're gonna work with. Always make sure that you're in 3D mode when you exit, Otherwise, it won't recognize your surface, and then the mesher will be mad at you. Um, so now let's go into the mesher and see what that looks like. Can you import like uh, models from like an X? Yes, yes. So fortunately, you don't have to build everything in Space Claim. You can import from a lot of other CAD software. It doesn't like the NX update, so when you're working with NX files. Um, I recommend exporting it from an NX into a step file, um, which then space claim will read beautifully. Um, that's one of the great things about ANSYS, is that, um, at least what, what the people there tell me, is that the, the CAD corporations don't want to compete with their simulation software, so for the time being at least, they're just giving them the ability to read all their CAD files. Um, so you can, you can import basically anything. Yeah, it's, it's loading. Um, one of the nice things about Workbench is if you look down here, there's this little red light and green light thing, and that tells you when it's still working and when it won't let you do anything versus when it's finished and then you can't do stuff, which sometimes is a little while. Um, so here's my surface. Um, I accidentally forgot to tell the program that it was a uh, 2D simulation so it wants me to specify thickness. I'll just do that here so I don't have to reload it. Um, but now I can, I can generate my mesh. Uh, this is a nice shape, so we can probably um, 
generate the default mesh, and it's pretty good. As you can see, it's, it's trying to build my thickness. But the piece that we want to look at is just this one. Um, and th this is pretty good. You can see there's some irregularities. Um, and you might want to address those. But one thing that you might really want to do is change the size. So if I want to just change the overall element size, I'll go here. And let's say I want it to be 5 millimeters, <coughs> then 0 0.005. And then now I have to regenerate my mesh. And there, it redrew it with the, with the conditions that I want. Um, so you can also do local sizing um, around different edges. So let's say I want to have, um, let's say I want to do some inflation, where I have the mesh refined more at one edge, and then it gets bigger and bigger as I go along. So if I select my body, um, I apply that to the scope, um, and then the boundary, I apply as this edge, and then let's see, how many layers do I want to have? And you'll, you'll see what this does. Um, it says no selections and boundaries. It did? No. I thought it had. There we go. Apply. Yeah, you have to click apply. And then I generate my mesh. Hopefully it doesn't fail. Um, which it did. It doesn't like to apply the inflation. Sorry, that was a bad example. Um, but yeah, this, this is a pretty simple example. So we'll, we'll just move on to specifying those conditions. Sorry, I'm not doing a very good job here. Um, so once you're satisfied with your mesh, um, let's say for this, this problem I have a, a temperature load on, let's say, this face, this edge. So making sure my selection filter here is set to edge, I can select the edge that I want, apply. Let's say that I have 100 degrees Celsius, I apply that there. Now note that in this magnitude, you have this little arrow here, which gives us this pop-up menu. And so now, if I wanted, I can specify that temperature by tabular data, which means like a table, a spreadsheet, or I can do it with a function. Um, if I want it as a function of position, for instance. Um, but right now, we'll just stick with the constant. Um, for a thermal simulation, if you don't specify a boundary condition, it will be insulated. So to make this interesting, I'll put a convection load, um, if it'll let me, on, on this edge. Oh, it doesn't want to be the edge. Well, in the demonstrations that I used to watch, it would always let you do it on an edge. But it doesn't seem to be liking me today. So, um, yeah, there we go. No, it's still not clear. Well, at any rate, you can apply your convection load. In this case, it goes across the entire face. Um, the GY is being a little, a little fuzzy. But then you apply your film coefficient, whatever that may be, five is a general standard value. Um, and then now you can right click on steady state thermal and press salt. Um, and then it'll go through and it'll, it'll solve your problem. And now to see your results, you tell it exactly what you want to see because um, it can tell you a lot. So let's say I want to see temperature. Um, let's say I want to see total heat flux. I insert those objects, and then I can right click on solution and evaluate all results. Um, and then to, to view each one, I can press it, and then it'll show me what it's doing. Um, so here's, here's the heat flux. The, here's the heat flux of the model you see. And you know those those results are fun and interesting. So that that's a very basic example, um, and that shows the basic principles of of how you apply 
your boundary conditions. You set your selection filter to whether you want to apply it to a, a point, an edge, a face, or a body. Then you scope the load to that body, um, and then you specify the value of your boundary condition. Any questions about that one? That one was, was pretty simple. Um, so the next example that I want to do is to show um, what you can do with composites. So you start by selecting under component systems, ACP pre, which is ANSYS composites prep. Um, and this lets you set up your model. Um, so then you, you head into space claim. And with ACP prep, generally, you want to create a shell body that shows what you're working with. Um, because the idea behind ACP is that it lays up supplies on the shell as though it were a mold. Um, in the mesher, it's using shell elements to model it, which means it's mathematically treating it a little differently as well. But that's also the principle, that's just in general the principle behind ACP. You can model solid bodies as well um, with solid elements, but um, I'm just getting started with this as well, and I haven't done any of that yet. So I'll show you the shell one, which is generally more standard. So let's say we're going to be making a cylinder, for instance, um, a rocket case, if you, if you happen to be working on one of those. Um, so let's say it has a diameter of, of 100 millimeters. Um, there's my circle. Um, I can now pull that circle. Um, it wants to make it a surface. But if I just select the edge um, and then the axis that I want, I can pull this body and I can make it a hollow cylinder. Let's say that it's two meters long. Um, one, interesting to think, one interesting thing to note about dimensions in space claim is that you can make them parameters. So if you want to vary geometry as a parameter set, I would just click this P here. Um, you know what, I'll just do that so then you can see what it does. Um, and then if I go back to the workbench, I see I now have a new object here. And if I click on it, it opens this parameter set where now I can specify different values um, for that number and then have it iterate through all of those automatically for me. Um, now we enter the model in, in the ACP prep which is very similar to um, very similar to what we just did. Uh, it runs off the same measure, so all those principles are the same. Yeah, at any time if you have questions, please feel free to stop. Yes? So how exactly do you change the parameters, and like, what do you do to have a parameter? Like, I'm still like, kind of confused, like, like, would you put like a function, like an NX, or, or what would you put in your parameter? Uh, no, um, if, you, if you saw when I was um, executing the pull command, um, see this little P here? Yeah. It appeared next to the dimension I was creating, and I clicked on it. Um, and then, in order to enter the values that I want for that parameter, I would go back into the workbench view, into the parameter set, and then I can if, if I wanted to then simulate a case that was 2,500 millimeters long. I enter that value there into the table, and it will go and iterate for 2,000 millimeters and 2,500 millimeters. It'll change that length, uh, which is a pretty nifty feature. So basically you have like two shapes, what you're saying? That's right. Okay. And it'll, it'll simulate for both of them with the, the same conditions that you apply. So once again, I have to specify a thickness. And then um, you'll note in here that the material assignment is automatically structural steel. Even though we'll be working in ACP um, to make a composite, this one doesn't matter because it'll just be overwritten later when we transfer it into the static structural model. Um, so we can now generate a mesh. And it's a regular shape. But you can see how easily it'll, it'll screw up a regular shape. Um, and so this is a more fun one to show you 
where you can look at the, the quality of your mesh. So if you go under, under details here, and then quality, if you select a, a certain mesh metric, for instance, element quality, um, it will then analyze the quality of each element in your mesh. And you can see that the average is 0.825, which is, in general, pretty good for a model, especially if you're modeling a, a, a strange solid. Um, in this case, though, obviously, we can go for a lot better because it's really simple. Um, to do that, I'm going to insert a face meshing control. Um, I'm going to tell it that this is this cylinder here is a face that I want to model. Um, I'm going to click apply, and then it turns pink to tell me that I've now made the current mesh that it's showing obsolete. Uh, we see here that the method of face meshing is quadrilaterals, so this will hopefully throw out a nice rectangular mesh for us to use, and it does. Um, but it's quite coarse, so you can go back into sizing here of the overall mesh, and I can I can change my mesh size. Or, if I want it, I can insert a sizing object and then scope it to a particular geometry, apply, and then change it from the default to be a little smaller. I think that's small. Anyways, that, that's the general idea. And there you go. And this is, this is a very nice mesh. And you, I can see if I go back to quality that um, my average quality is now very high, uh, 0.97. Don't expect to see that very often. Uh, that's a very good day. Uh, but in general, you want your average Definitely to be above 0.8. If it's below 0.8, you have a problem, um, and, and you want to refine it. If I want to look at the, the elements that are bad, um, then usually in the, this graph will have bars. Um, I'm not quite sure why, why they're not displaying. Um, it's probably just because I have very few elements. Um, but normally, this graph will have bars, and you can click on the bar that's of a lesser quality, and it'll show. Um, in the display, just the elements that are in that quality range. So you can see exactly what regions are bad, you know, where you have to refine it or insert another control. Yeah, Diego. Yeah. So how did um, Ansys know how like big to make it the cylinder and whether it was hollow or just filled up, I guess? Um, I specified the thickness of the cylinder here. Okay. Um, and then it's hollow because that's the geometry that I made the space for. So you can make it like as a surface and then make it completely fill out basically as well? Yes, you could. Um, but ANSYS ACP probably wouldn't like that. That's, that's not what you should do for composites. <coughs> for composites in general, it, it's, it's nice to model it as a shell if you can. Okay, and yeah. that's, that's what I'm going to use since recent cases, right? That's right. I might have missed this, but why does ACP even want the thickness? Um, it wants a thickness just because um, that's how ANSYS deals with the shell elements. Okay. So you just set so, it to like something super small, like one millimeter or? Well, you would set it to the thickness that it actually is when you let it plus. Oh, I see. Um, I see. So, so that's the idea. I should probably remember this now. Um, it's going to be pointed out because you can see that thickness has a little box next to it. If I click that, it becomes a P, which means that now I've made it a parameter. And now it will also appear in this parameter set. Um, see, there it is. And I could vary that too if I want. Offset type is somewhat important to know. That just states whether your thickness is executed from the bottom of the shell or from the middle. Um, and that's where you can do that. So, now we're going to head to ACP, which fortunately loads very quickly. Um, oh, there, the computer's are running me again. Um, if you see this lightning bolt next to a cell, that means that the computer wants you to update it. Um, so you right click and update, and then it'll 
turn the wheels inside and say that you're ready to go again. If your solution has a lightning bolt next to it, that means that when you click update, it will solve for a solution. Uh, so be more mindful of that. But when you have a, a lightning bolt next to the model in general, um, if you're finished with it, it's probably a good idea to update. So now we can go into um, ACP, except that I forgot an important step, which is for ACP, you need to specify your, your engineering data which is basically the materials that you'll be using inside. Um, so for simplicity, um, you can define your own by adding it here, if I have a composite. Um, and then you, you drag material properties onto it, and then you can you know, type out what they are. Um, but for speed, I'm going to use materials from the library. Um, it has a, pretty, a fairly large library. And if you enter into it, you click on that button, select the, the data source, and then, let's see, I want to have woven carbon epoxy pre -pray. so I'm going to click this plus sign and add it to my engineering library. Let's say I also want carbon fiber, I'll click the plus sign and add it to my library. And then if I go back to my materials, you can see that they're here. For ACP, you need to specify a ply type. So you can see for the woven, the ply type has been specified by ANSYS as woven. For the carbon fiber, it doesn't have a ply type yet. So I'm going to go under composite, drag a ply type to it, um, and this one is just going to be regular. So it's just carbon fibers um, running with the ply. Yeah? What's ACP again? ANSYS Composites Prep. Okay. Or ANSYS Composites Post if you're using the, the pr post processing unit. For right now, we're just setting it up in prep. So now, we can see that the model wants to refresh because I changed some things. And now I can enter into my setup, except it's not happy for some reason. Oh, because I have this undefined material. That's, ANSYS has little little things sometimes that are said. Yeah, if you ever see a, a question mark here instead of a check or a lightning bolt, that means that something is undefined, which means that it'll stop and be unhappy with you, maybe turn you an error. Um, but fortunately, if you have something that's undefined, it'll highlight the box in yellow, so you won't have to just hunt through the white to find it. Um, it will be pretty clear. <coughs> yeah. Is there a reason why it says like show two messages at the bottom right? Is that like some yes. <laughs> yes. When it when it throws an error or something, it'll it'll give a message. Um, doesn't want to show them right now because the GUI is a little strange, but they're here somewhere. Um, let's see if I if I move that down. Yeah. Messages are full screen. Now. Yeah, and see, it, it was telling me that one of my components um, needed attention since it had the question mark. Uh, so anyway, let's get into let's get into ACP and lay up some plots. Um, ACP is a little is a little tricky, but once you get the hang of it, it's very easy to use. Um, so you can see in my materials. It's imported the ones that I want. It has lightning bolts. So I'm going to go and update them. And now they're green. Green check works are good. Um, in ACP, you'll, you'll have to create each fabric. Um, because it has a material, but it needs to know how thick it is and what angles you want it to run at. So let's call this um, just woven. The material I select as woven. And the thickness I specify as one half the thickness that I specified the cylinder as since I only want to make two plies here. Um, one other cool thing that you can do in, is in this analysis tab, if you press these buttons before you hit apply to create the material, it'll give you this nice plot of the material properties um, as a function of angle. So you can see for this woven one, it's very strong um, in the direction of the two woven fibers. 
The good thing to keep in mind in ACP is that you always want to click apply or okay when you're making things so that you tell it to generate them. Otherwise, sometimes if you close out, it'll just lose your data. Um, so now I'm going to make a unidirectional fly out of carbon fiber. <coughs> I always like to have this data generated. And then I apply, and there it is. Okay. Um, if you want, you can make a, a stack up or a sub laminate of several plies that you might be using um, more often. Uh, so if you have a recurring sequence of plies, you can create a stack up. And then when you're actually making the layup in modeling groups, you'll just be able to call that stack up. And then I have three plies automatically grouped together. Um, but I won't, I won't show that now. Um, what you will then need to do is define a rosette. Um, whoops, wrong You'll need to define a rosette, which is basically a little um, coordinate system. Uh, and it'll ask you for an origin and directions. Note that also that while everything else in ANSYS has units nicely done for you, ACP does not. It, it'll just run at, at whatever the project units are, and <coughs> all of these are just numbers. So you need to make sure that you're putting in all the right numbers. Otherwise, you might accidentally, you know, make a case that's a meter thick when you meant it to be an inch, but you were in meters. So uh, that, that might throw off your numbers by the way. Um, so I'm just going to create this rosette. There it is. Update, and now I have a green check mark, which is good because now it's ready to use. Another thing that you need to do is create an oriented selected set. And what this is, is a set of elements of your mesh that all have the same reference direction. You need this because when you tell each element to be a certain material, the material properties of composites are directional. So they all need to have the same reference system so that they can talk to each other um, and make sure that your fibers are pointing in the right direction. So element sets. I'm going to go to element sets and then click on it and it applies it there. Um, I need to select the rosette that I made so I can select it there. Um, and then I want to specify the direction. So let's see, my axial direction is the Z direction, I believe. Um, there it is, the Z direction. So specify it as one. Apply. And there we go. Um, I'll assume to fit or not assume to fit. There we go. <coughs> and now I have my oriented selected set, um, which has its x direction pointed in the z direction, since that's what I specified the direction of that oriented selected set to be. Now I can start to make a layout. So I create a modeling group. And then now that I have a modeling group, I can create plies. To this ply, I specify oriented selected set, what kind of ply I want it to be, and then the angle that I want it to be at. So if I want it to be very interesting and have woven 90 degree fibers <coughs> at a 30 degree angle, I can do that. And I can apply. OK. And now I have it. One of the useful tools, if you expand this and then select these arrows, is that I can now see the fiber directions. So if I zoom in, I can see these are the directions that my fibers are heading at. Or at least this is the, the positive direction. Um, since I have 90 degrees, um, I, I can highlight the transverse directions to see what both fibers in the ply are doing. And you can use that to kind of verify that you, you set it up right. Yeah, Diego? Uh, I was wondering, like, what's the purpose of the rosette again? Uh, the purpose of the rosette is to just 
make sure that you're not dependent on the global coordinate system for every oriented selected set. Um, so basically that's like a, like a coordinate? That's right. System. It's, it's, it's its own little origin, if you will, um, that you can use to define directions um, for your excuse me, for your oriented selected sets. And then if I wanted, I can, you know, add another plot. Um, this one will be my UD, again, with my oriented selected set, uh, 55.9, let's say, I apply. And then again, I can, I can see the direction that it's going. And that's it. Now, I, now I've told the computer exactly how my ply is built. Um, ACP, fortunately, is is pretty easy to use once you get your handle. Once you get a handle of the little the little tricks. Um, for instance, in, instead of you know typing out oriented selected set one, you just have the cursor there, and then you click it, and then it will automatically appear there. Um, but otherwise. Otherwise, it's very easy to use. <coughs> it wants to update, so we'll update. And then we can build our model in static structure. So for ACP Pre, you don't use drag and drop. You create first an independent static structural <coughs> system, and then you take the setup cell and connect it to the model cell of the static structure. And then it'll ask you to transfer solid composite data or shell composite data. We have a shell mesh, we want shell composite data. So we'll tell it to do that. And then you see it's made a linkage here. And the static structural model got rid of the engineering data and geometry because now it's dependent on what you have here um, in the ACP pre. And now we can open up our, mod our model and begin to set up the problem. Sorry if I'm not making this the most exciting thing in the world. Um, it can be a little tedious, um, especially to start. But it's, it's really useful, um, as you can tell. It's, it's very difficult to do hand calculations, um, especially on composites in the same way. Um, so let's see. What, what loads do I want to have? A pressure load, for instance, on the inside of the case. So I can apply that. Zero pascals, that's not much fun. Um, let's make it 800 kilopascals. Um, and you see that it says ramped, that means that it's going to apply it in several load steps. Uh, that's all that that means. You can see the arrow here specifies the direction. You know, if I want it to come from the other direction, it's just as easy as making it a negative. And now I have an external pressure. But we don't need that because our rockets tend to explode from the inside. So I'll make that an internal pressure. And then you'll notice also in static structural I have supports. If I try to solve this model right now, I will get an error because there are not enough constraints applied to prevent the model from moving. It has too many degrees of freedom. So I need to constrain the model in some way so that the computer can figure out a solution for each point. So I'm going to add a fixed support here. For instance, I apply it to, um, not to that face, I apply it to this edge, um, apply, and now this end is fixed, should allow it to solve the model. And there we go. Let's see, 
deformation. Let's see, stress. Um, and you'll see here in, in mechanical, it wants to know how you want to see the stress. Um, we'll just do it by layer, um, which is easier. But I can show um, composite spread post too if you want. Um, and there's deformation. Um, why does it look like a cornucopia? Because I applied a fixed boundary condition at this edge which let it solve my model, but it means that, that entire hoop isn't going to go anywhere. So I would look at that and say, hmm, this probably isn't the best boundary condition for my model. Um, and then you have to try to find some other way to constrain it that allows the solver to do what it needs to do, but also <laughs> accurately represents um, what you're trying to model. For the case, that's actually been something that's kind of hard, been hard for me to figure out. Um, because it needs, it needs a lot of constraints. Um, if it has like three degrees of freedom, it'll, it'll tend to not, to not converge. But you also don't want this to happen. Um, so yeah, you have to kind of play around with the other supports that it offers in here. For instance, um, a cylindrical support um, which basically tells a cylinder whether or not it can expand radially, axially, or um, move tangentially, um, and then some others in here. All of which have their own assumptions that you'll need to read into when you're establishing your problem. And that's part of what makes ANSYS so difficult. Yeah, anyway. So would that be you're trying to model here? Like, are you trying to model like a force on it, or? Yeah, there's, there's an internal pressure that I specify inside the case. Oh, so like if you have like, like water <coughs> type, basically. Yeah, or or a gas, oh. um, say burning solid rock propellant um, that exerts pressure on my case, and I can see the stresses. Um, where are their highest? Where are their lowest? Um, there's a neat tool, maximum and minimum. I can see exactly where my maximum and minimum stresses are. Um, so now you can see, interestingly, here, the contour bands across this one element. Um, so what's happening there is that's showing the interpolation of the stresses across that element. And you see it's just very linearly, linearly, because there's a certain stress on one side and a certain stress on the other. And it's just going to vary between those. Um, but that may not be accurate. So when you see something that's like this, where it's kind of consistent over here, and then just linearly varying across one element, that's a good indicator of I should refine my mesh in this area to get a good idea of what's really going on instead of just a linear approximation, which in general is, is not very accurate. So yeah, th those, are, those are the main demonstrations that I wanted to show. Um, hopefully they give a idea of, of ANSYS. If you want, I can do a fluids demonstration as well. But it's been an hour, and I'm not, I'm not Max. I'm not the most entertaining presenter I know. Um, so yeah, if you have any questions um, or want to see that fluids demonstration, I, I'd be happy to do so. Um, but thanks for coming. Um, I hope this was helpful. I hope this helps to like at least give an idea of where to click. So if you want to keep going, let me know. I'll be opening up the ANSYS channel on Discord. And then um, just DM me, and I can give you access to the ANSYS Learning Hub. Um, the ANSYS Learning Hub is something that we get, um, that ANSYS provides to its commercial customers, but they let their academic customers use for 120 days. And what it has is, an immense array of PowerPoints and, and videos and forums to really get started and get a good idea. Um, a thing that I would recommend if you're kind of uncertain is on the download instructions, there's a link to an edX course. Um, that edX course is a very, very good introduction to FEA and the basics behind ANSYS. That's what I started with. Um, I really recommend. So look into those and let me know. Thanks for coming.